Luke 5, verses 27 through 32. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We will spend the coming weeks uh, leading us up to the Advent season, focusing on the lifestyle of gospel hospitality, as illustrated there by Rosaria Butterfeld. Hospitality, you might wonder, why would we take this particular topic and focus on this topic at this time for so long? Five compelling reasons. First, because the Bible commands us to practice hospitality. That should be enough in and of itself for those of us who are serious about following Jesus. Secondly, because hospitality meets a deep need in the lives, our lives and the lives of others, for meaningful relationships. Third, because this need for deep relationships seems to be more acutely experienced here in Central Florida where so many of us are separated from family and friends we left behind when we moved here. Fourth, because each of us is supposed to be sharing our faith in Christ with those who right now are outside of Him. And hospitality is a form of pre-evangelism. The practical love that we show in hospitality creates a fertile environment for gospel conversations to take place more naturally. And fifth, because the launching of our new campus in St. Cloud reminds all of us that we are not serving an institution. We are fulfilling a mission that is given to us by Jesus himself. Hospitality fosters discipleship. And disciple-making is our mission. But before we get into this morning's message, we need to say a word about hospitality, and I want to give a little bit of history as to how its meaning has changed through the centuries. Today, as Henry Nowlin has pointed out, hospitality conjures up images of tea parties and bland conversation and a general atmosphere of coziness. When we talk today about hospitality, we're usually referring to one of two things. First, we usually are referring to having family and friends over for a fun evening together and perhaps sharing a meal that has been created with a little more care and a little more creativity. We call that hospitality. Or, when we say hospitality, especially as it is understood here in the shadow of the great mouse and the great wizard and the great whale, <laughs> hospitality is a whole industry of providing accommodations for the 126 million out-of-state visitors who come to our state every year. Many of us are employed by this, the hospitality industry. When we talk about hospitality, we usually mean having friends over or the hospitality industry. But neither of these is what the Bible is talking about when it refers to hospitality. What has changed the focus and the definition? In the 18th century, the English writer 
Samuel Johnson, connected this change to society's new social and economic conditions. As nations increasingly became more commercialized, the ancient understanding of hospitality changed. Why? Because people no longer had time for indiscriminately having others into their homes. As things got commercialized, business took over, time was too precious. We were becoming more committed to being productive and making more money. And so hospitality started to get reduced to this, garnering power and influence by starting to have only certain people over to your home, seated at your table, the ones who may benefit you in your pursuit of wealth, which meant that the poor, the needy, the marginalized strangers got squeezed out in our understanding of this term. John Wesley saw the perversion of hospitality in the 18th century and he condemned it. Hospitality actually became a bad word to John Wesley. He preached that using your home and resources just to promote more business, just to impress your friends, is something that God will not tolerate. Because God will not allow himself to be mocked in this way. Because it meant, again, that the needs of the poor and the strangers, close to the heart of God, were people now being neglected by those who claimed to be following Jesus. But Christian leaders saw this coming well before the 18th century. You could go all the way back to the 1500s. John Calvin mourned the demise of ancient hospitality, and he warned the, that the increasing dependence on inns rather than on personal hospitality was an expression of human depravity. Imagine that. That's what he preached. The fact that we're building all of these hotels and everybody's going to the hotel meant they're not coming into homes an expression of depravity. Why such a negative assessment? It highlights for us the seriousness with which the greats like Calvin and Wesley took the practice of hospitality by the church. They saw hospitality as being central to the very mission of the church. And to redefine it, or to water it down or pervert its understanding in any way would leave us short of God's intention for Christians and the poor and the rejects and itinerant missionaries would be the ones to suffer most of all. When it comes to the Bible, the definition of hospitality is really quite simple even though it, the, its definition still challenges many of our uh, notions today. Here's the Greek word for hospitality. I don't know that that means anything to any of you. <laughs> Philonexia is the word. It's two words put together. Philos, if any of us know Greek, some of us know Philadelphia as the city of brotherly love. Philos is from Philadelphia. It's, uh, it has to do with the, the love part of the brotherly love, having uh, affection for a friend, a deep relationship, deep friendship kind of love. That's what philos means. And then xenos means stranger. So you put them together and hospitality, in a biblical sense, is making deep friendships of strangers. It is warmth, friendliness, shown to strangers. In New Testament times, it meant the readiness to share generosity by opening up one's home to others. This morning, we begin this crucial series by focusing on the source of this kind of gospel hospitality from a story in Luke's gospel that, Jesus, uh, that involved Jesus. It begins with what happens when Jesus places his call upon your life. 
Verse 27. After this, that is, look back up, after Jesus hailed the paralytic, after this he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. Note from this very first verse who Jesus chooses as a disciple. He chooses Levi, later to be known as Matthew. But he was known in the day to everyone as a scummy tax collector, and that's an understatement because tax collectors were terribly despised. They were generally very crooked people, not just because people didn't like to pay their taxes any more than we do today, but to be a tax collector meant that you had turned your back on your own people and you had sided for the purposes of great uh, personal monetary gain, you had sided with the Roman oppressors. Rome had delegated the collection of taxes to turncoats who could earn lots and lots of money, whatever they could get away with. And the way they earned their money was by adding surcharges to the taxes collected for Rome, but the tax collectors kept all of those surcharges for themselves. And because when you're being oppressed by a foreign power like Rome, the people didn't want any trouble with Rome any more than we do with the IRS today. And so they pretty much had to pay whatever the tax collector demanded, even though he was lining his own pockets with the exorbitant extra fees. Don't you hate that when you get the bill and you read it? All the extra fees they tack on there, you think, ah, I thought this was $30 and it turned out to be $75. How'd that happen? And you read in and they charge you for everything. Well, that's what tax collectors did. And they would just charge whatever they wanted, put it on your bill, force it out of you, or they'll turn you into Rome and then took the money and put it in their pockets. And they were doing it, doing it in this case, Matthew, as a Jew, turning his back on his fellow Jews and siding with the Romans. No wonder they hated this guy. But here's the, here's the message of the text. This is the guy that Jesus chooses as one of his 12 disciples. Now, if you were going to start a movement to change the world, that's the guy you would choose. This tells us something about Jesus. It tells us something about grace. It tells us something about the power of the gospel to transform you. The late Mike Iaconelli tells of an experience that he had that illustrates Jesus' surprising way of choosing leaders. The Northern California State Finals in the high school track and field were being hosted in his town a few years back, and each participant had won at least one event in the regional competition in order to be eligible for these state meets. You know how that works. Well, Mike Iaconelli noticed that during the warm-ups, uh, for the state girls 3,200 meter run, which was eight laps around the track, he said, I noticed one girl who appeared to be limping very badly. And when I looked closer, I saw that her legs seemed to be twisted and her feet were turned in at this really awkward angle and I just couldn't believe that she was actually in the state finals race and that she, um, I just assumed he said that she was a manager for one of the teams and that the, when the race began, they'd just all give her the warm-up jerseys until it was over. But no, when the bell rang, indicating it was time for the contestants to line up, she was not a manager. She stepped up to the line and stood there with the rest of the girls. When the gun went off, she started racing. And I assumed that, although she was limping, that she'd be able to keep up somehow with the rest of the runners. I was wrong. At the end of just the first lap, she was already a whole quarter of a lap, quarter of the track behind. And by the time everyone else had finished, she still had a whole lap to go herself. And as she was making her way down the back stretch, we could all see the agony on her face because every step she took was excruciatingly painful, but she would not stop. Without realizing it, all of us in the stands found that we had risen to our feet 
and we had started cheering her on. And as she passed by in front of the stands, the noise became overpowering because we were all screaming in unison, Go! 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 And when she finally passed the finish line, the crowd erupted in a lengthy ovation. Iaconelli says, That race took place a very long time ago. But to this day, I have no idea who won the girls' 3,200, but I will never forget the girl who lost. By the way, he says, I discovered how she ended up in the race. She was from a very small school region and was the only person to run in the 3,200, so she qualified. Most of the girls with her disability wouldn't have, would have declined to run at the state final But thank God she did not. The grace of God to you and me says this. I can make last place more significant than first place. I take the last and make them first. I choose the foolish things to confound the wise. I will use prostitutes to teach other people about gratitude. I will use lepers as examples of cleanliness. I will take men who persecute the church and make them pillars. I will take the dead and I will give them life. I will take the uneducated fishermen and I will make them fishers of men. God's grace does not exist to make us successful. God's grace exists to point people to a love like no other love they will have ever known. I'll choose Levi. That's what he does. But you'll also notice in this verse the nature of the call of Jesus. Follow me. Follow It's a call to action, not passive intellectual belief. And you'll notice that his call is focused on Jesus. Follow me. I'm the one who will set the agenda. I'm the one who will develop the curriculum. I'm the one who will exercise a very kind but absolute authority. Whatever evolution takes place in our church's facilities in the future, our uh, church's staffing or programming or priorities, one thing must remain constant if we are to be a healthy, biblically aligned church. And it's this, we have to follow Jesus. We have to uh, study. We have to come to a thorough understanding of his teachings, of his identity of his mission and study all of those things for the purpose of following him. Keeping in step with him, adopting his values as our own and his attitude as our own, his mindset increasingly becoming our mindset. Remember, isn't that what Paul said in Philippians 2? Have this mind among yourselves. Have the same attitude of Jesus who even though he was in the highest position, humbled himself all the way to the lowest position, taking the form of a servant, even to the point of death, death on a cross. And that's why God highly exalted him to the highest place. Gave him the name above every other name. You will know that you are following Jesus if this is true. The more I follow him, the more I resemble him. Not perfectly, but discernibly and increasingly over time. In fact, 1 John 2 verses 5 and 6 say this, this is how we know that we are in Christ. You want to know if you're in Christ and all that that means? Here's how you know. Quote, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus lived. We also learn from this text 
what happens when the gospel changes you. Verses 28 and 29. So Jesus hears, Jesus says to Levi, follow me, and Levi leaves everything. He rose and followed him. And then Levi made Jesus a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And so, just imagine the impact Jesus had on people. This is poor peasant, didn't even have a place to lay his head, but when he said, follow me, a guy like Levi immediately leaves everything. And here's what's different about Levi than the rest of the disciples that Jesus called. Levi could never go back to his old job. If he walks away from this tax collector's booth, he's not coming back. It's not like the fishermen. Oh, we'll just go back on the Sea of Galilee and start fishing again. He can't do that. The call to follow Jesus is all-encompassing. It involves all that you are. It's not, about, it's not a religious thing or a weekend thing or a traditional thing. It's all that you are, all that you have. Jesus, Lord, over all. No turning back, no turning back. And that's what Levi does. He gets up, leaves everything, and follows Jesus. And, the text says, he threw Jesus a party. The New Living Translation says, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. So the first thing that Levi does when the gospel grabs his heart, raises him to a whole new life, from death to life, the first thing he does is to throw a party so that all of his friends can meet Jesus. Interestingly, Jesus comes to the party. And I say interestingly because it could be perceived as somewhat self-centered, couldn't it? I mean, Levi goes, look, I'm going to put them, buy all this food, we're going to kill the calves, we're going to cook the steaks, we're going to drink the wine, come on to the party, it's all about you, and that could feel a little self-centered, but Jesus chooses to come. And the text tells us it's a big party. It's going to be a big party with all kinds of sinners there. And Jesus is eating and drinking with them right in front of God and everybody. And he goes. This is the kind of thing you do when Jesus changes you. Ask my wife about how it changed her when she was a freshman in college. She surrendered her life to Jesus in August of 1977, right before she went off to college. And when she got to college, she went up and down her dorm, freshman dorm room floor and told everybody about Jesus. And she put up posters all about Jesus, and she played only Christian music. It's like Jesus got a hold of her and completely changed everything, and then you do stuff like this. That's what he did. Your experience of the gospel becomes the source of radical hospitality, as it does here for Levi. But we also understand from this text what happens when you misunderstand the gospel. Verse 30, and the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? So in contrast to Jesus, the religious elite of his day, the Pharisees and their scribes, have a false understanding of what the gospel is all about. They think it's about following the law with such precision it makes you more worthy than other people to be accepted by God. That's what they thought. It's about how well I'm performing, how well I'm living up to these standards, even our traditions. That's what they thought. And because they thought that and they see Jesus not living up to what they perceive to be the standards, according to their traditions, he's hanging out with all of these low-life people, they start to grumble. When they grumble, they don't follow the principles of peacemaking. They don't go to Jesus. They pull the disciples, the disciples who are still very much green in their own understanding of these things. They pull the disciples aside and say, hey, what's the deal? Why is your boss eating with all the riffraff, drinking with all the undesirables? Why is he doing that? Here's one of the ways that you can tell that you have the attitude of Jesus. You have a heart for the riffraff. You have a heart for 
those that other people find undesirable. That's where Jesus chooses to manifest himself. And if you want to know Jesus and follow him, you have to go there. That's how you know you're in him, because you start to walk as Jesus walked. You go where Jesus goes. When you join Jesus on mission, that's what we learn in verses 31 and 32. Jesus answered when he heard them grumbling in this way. Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but the ones who are sick need the doctor. And I haven't come to call the ones who think they're so righteous. I came here for the sinners. And I'm not watering down the standards. I came for them to call them to repentance. I came to make the sinners my friends. I came to practice hospitality. I came to open up the Father's house and to invite them in. I came for them. Mike Iaconelli again. Our town is very small by California standards, just one traffic light, 6,000 residents. One Sunday morning I was preaching about the unconditional love of God, a love that colors outside the lines and uh, resulted in a church that loves outside the lines. And our church is different than most, he says, the congregation feels free to interrupt me during my sermons. Just as I was finishing, a 16-year-old girl said, Hey, this is a good sermon, Pastor. But I was thinking that if we're supposed to love outside the lines, then I know how we can do it. Because in three weeks, the Siskiyou County Fair is coming, and with the fair come all the carnies. You know what carnies are. The carnies are itinerant workers who operate the rides at the traveling carnival, and every year the carnies are the talk of this rural town. Most of them are tough-looking, scary, tattoos, huge muscles, hard-looking faces. People always make derogatory comments about them. And this high school girl continued, I was thinking that instead of making fun of the carnies, maybe we should have a dinner and welcome them to town. And the church agreed. And this young girl organized the entire event. She called the manager of the fair for permission. She called the owner of the carnival to see if they would want a dinner. The carnival owner suggested a lunch just before the fair opened. Okay, she said, we'll, have, we'll barbecue hamburgers and cheeseburgers. We'll have salad, dessert, and soft drinks. All you can eat. How many should we expect? And the carnival owner thought for a while and said, expect 50. The day of the lunch... About 20 people from church showed up to help serve. We had enough food to serve 70 people. At 12.30, which is when the lunch began, only four carnies showed up. Within an hour, by 1.30, however, we hadn't served 50 carnies or 75 or even 150 carnies. We had served 200 carnies. And when it looked like we would run out of food, the young girl came up to me, the pastor, and said, we're running out of food, get some. <laughs> you, you divide up the loaves and fishes here, pastor. That, and he did. He went and got more food. When the lunch was over, numerous carnies came up to the young girl and thanked her. One older lady in particular who had been working carnivals for a long time said, I have been doing carnivals for 40 years and this is the first time anyone has ever welcomed me into their town. The all-you-can-eat carny lunch now has been going on for seven years, all because a teenage girl was naive enough to believe that God meant what he said. He loved a group of carnies as much as he loved her. And maybe that's what we need to pray for in St. Cloud, in celebration. Naive grace. That would be the kind of, that we would be the kind of church that never loses its 
childlike faith. And when Jesus says to do something, when he tells us, I love those people, that we would actually follow in his footsteps and love them too. It may take us to places and people we never expected to meet, places we never expected to go, but we are following him. He saved us through the gospel, and we understand what that gospel teaches, that he came to seek and to save the lost. And therefore, you can't be following Jesus if you don't seek to extend his mission. The gospel becomes the wellspring of hospitality. Every week, as we focus on this crucial, central topic of hospitality, we're going to share a brief video um, as a story of people within our fellowship who are actually living out these principles of following Jesus, practicing hospitality, yes, to friends and family, but beyond that. Here's one example. We matched the sign, it's red. That ain't oh, we did that on purpose. <laughs> And we do Tuesday movie night. How did this come about? How did we start this? Well, we were in church. We have the best worship ever of anywhere on earth, we think, at CCC. But we saw young adults sitting alone. How do we get them together? How do we get them to know each other outside the church so they can be buddies and sit together in church? You know, kind of build the local church. So we just invited a few of them to join us at the movies. And Tuesday's great because it's $5 night. And they started coming. And then they came and came. And now it's been two and a half years. And it's like a family. And everybody brings their new friends that come to town. And it works really super great. Well, we usually meet uh, 30 minutes before the movie starts. And so everybody kind of congregates out here in front of AMC. And we talk about life in general. And then we go to the movie, and then afterwards, usually we hang out another 30 minutes, talk about the movie. So it's really like a family. Um, there are folks here that don't have family here, so holidays, maybe they're working and can't go home. The Tuesday movie group has kind of grown into just doing life together. We do holidays and just get-togethers. Tuesday movie group uh, shows love to the stranger by just welcoming them in. We want to hear what happened in their day, we give them a big hug, and we're just kind of family. Um, then we have a couple of girls even coming brand new tonight. Each week we almost have new folks. So because this uh, movie night is every week, um, we're getting comfortable with each other. And so because of that, relationships form and we can have deep conversations, spiritual conversations. And so when we come out of these movies, you know, the movies usually have some kind of plot and the character did acted in a certain way. Uh, and we talk about what motivated that person and how being in God's kingdom and following Jesus um, might be look different than what happened in the movie. Or sometimes that the movie actually does something where the person is doing it correctly. This group is really good also about loving strangers and the people that work here. Um, so there's a gentleman, his name is David. He's in his mid 80s and he's a custodian here. And he's cleaning the bathrooms all the time when we're here. And this team blows me away. They'll just go in and love on David and thank him for cleaning the restrooms or it's the person taking the tickets or the person giving the popcorn. And it's just really fun. When we come back week to week, the people are thrilled to see us here. They're not like, oh no, here comes that crazy group. They're like, hey y'all, come on in. Welcome, we're glad to see you tonight. So I think the movie night uh, loves on strangers even outside the church. I'm here every Tuesday helping Terry with any issues that she has. talking to somebody and they're like, I want to start a Tuesday movie group. I want to do something like you. What would you tell them? Well, they're going to have to be, they're going to have to like it themselves or it'll never sustain. Like we live, we go to the movies anyhow. And so we just had friends start coming along and then they would invite other friends. And so it's going to have to be something you have a passion for. The reason we do Tuesday movie night is to build the local church. It's simple. That's it. We love our church. 
and we wanted to build relationships so that when people are worshiping, they know the people they're sitting by. Love you. Uh, thank you so much for always bringing us together on Tuesday nights. It's amazing. The amazing group of people that we have out here that uh, we get to share with each other and just uh, meet up with one another. And uh, you guys continue just to pour out Christ's love on us and so we can bring other people in and pour out on others. So thank you so much. The church being the church, following Jesus. Let's pray. So Jesus, open our eyes, open our hearts, and open our homes that we would learn in ever increasing measure to love others the way you have loved us. Amen.